everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hello guys and girls from Spanish Libertarian, here at Zignazi. And as you can see, today I'm not talking in Spanish, I'm using another language that is English. And that's why, because we have our first host for our English interviews, and that's the YouTuber Tyler Preston20. Tyler, how are you doing, man? Great, how are you doing? I'm fine, I'm just talking with you and, and that's, that just makes my day better. Uh, for the ones who, you, uh, who don't know Tyler, he has a, an amazing YouTube channel and also he's creating a lot of content uh, that is related with the Spanish culture and the Spanish language and I think that's one of the big reasons that we are talking uh, today. As I usually do with my hosts, uh, the first question it would be um, who is Tyler Preston and what's your intellectual or professional background and then we will be talking about different topics. So Tyler, the floor is yours. Okay, um, I started my YouTube channel, I believe it was in 2000, well, 2014. And I think my interest into talking about uh, issues about like social justice warriors and politics stem from the um, campaign that was done in the United States a long time ago. It was a campaign that was called uh, Ban Bossy. And basically there was like a group of women, like I remember one of the women was like a person from Facebook and she basically complained that people call women bossy. And I thought this is just really stupid. Like anybody could be called bo <laughs> bossy, right? <laughs> and so I started to make videos about that. And I started to see channels like, uh, buzzfeed for example i saw channels like um mtv news a lot of different social justice channels that started to make this kind of nonsense and i started to uh, make videos about it um my original channel unfortunately got deleted because i guess somebody was actually pissed off at one of my videos and so the current channel that i have right now is my second channel on youtube and I used to have like, uh, I think it was 40,000 subscribers. Now I have like 17,000 subscribers, thanks to that person getting pissed off. So um, basically I just do like social justice, uh, commentary on like uh, Islam. And like you said, I also have an interest in like uh, Spanish culture and Latino culture. And I like to make some videos about that too. So I guess the first, I'm, I'm, I'm just freaking out. So they closed your channel and you had like 40,000 subscribers. I mean, how did that make you feel? And how, how so did, uh, how, what's the, the opinion that you'd have like of uh, freedom of speech and YouTube? Because apparently YouTube is an uh, open platform for ideas, but uh, what's, what's the deal here? Okay, when I first got notification that my channel was deleted, I was really upset because I put a lot of time, a lot of effort to shoot my videos, to edit my videos, to post it online, to create the thumbnails. So I felt at first that all the time and energy I did for making my videos was wasted because it was just gone. However, I guess over time I got over it and my thoughts about YouTube's policy about free speech. Um, I think that every country should have a First Amendment. I heard, at least through the interview that I had with uh, Un Tío Blanco Header out, that he basically um, does not have free speech in countries like Spain. And I'm kind of surprised because when I heard people like uh, that Scottish guy getting arrested for that, that dog joke, I was upset because I feel as though that free speech is something that every country should have. And I feel fortunate that I live in a country that allows me to have free speech and to fully express myself. And I think that for the case of YouTube, like ultimately they have a right to do whatever they want with their platform. However, I feel as though that they're trying to just demonetize people's videos for no good reason. Like I heard people saying that, um, that when they started to make videos, automatically they demonetize the video because it was an insensitive subject. So I think that YouTube is being unfair to those people and to those content creators because ultimately YouTube relies on those people, including myself, 
for their revenue. And so by trying to demonetize it, you're not going to get as much revenue from people who make videos. So I feel as though that they're not taking the whole entire issue of free speech seriously on YouTube. So what's the alternative? Maybe I heard that some YouTubers are just having their Patreon accounts and I mean, uh, do you have any idea on, uh, on mind that just in case they demonetize your video, you can have income like directly from your subscribers or followers? Um, well, besides Patreon, um, there's another site that I know of. It's called, um, what was it? Minds.com. That's what it's called. It's M-I-N-D-S.com. And basically, I've seen people like uh, Sargon of Akkad, uh, Tim Pohl, other big anti-SJW YouTubers on Minds.com. And they can post videos and they can make money from posting the videos on that site. Well, I, I tend or I want to be optimistic about this. And I think a new platform will emerge and they will capitalize these people who are upset with this. But okay, let's talk about uh, the United States because uh, the land of the free, the home of the brave, the, the place where you can uh, achieve whatever you want in life through the American dream. But then you, you see what's happening and what has happened in different universities and it's just pure nonsense. So my big or my first big question would be what's going on around there because it seems that the land of prosperity and capitalism and freedom, it's now being like ripped off for the same citizens or, or, or what's the deal? How, how do you feel all this mood? Okay, what's going on basically in universities, I think is basically that um, all of these people were growing up saying that they could achieve everything in life and they end up going to a place where they don't really achieve much in life. And so they feel as though that they need special attention to, you know, feel special about themselves. I also think it comes down to what they're also teaching in um, the universities. Like, for example, I'm not sure if this is in Spain, but in the United States, we have something that's called the gender studies class. It's basically like when people start to teach kids about uh, the social justice ideology and feminism. And basically, they come to the classrooms and they get indoctrinated with the ideas of social justice and feminism, and they come off as like super ultra left because they go to these classrooms. So I think it's not only just the idea of them trying to feel special, but also what they're teaching inside the classrooms and universities. So that's, that's serious stuff. That sounds to me like a dystopian, communist, post-truth area. I mean, is it serious? Is, uh, it, that's a serious topic. Uh, how do you how do you feel? How do you hear people when they talk in a bar or uh, with a family or just a friendly conversation? What's the what's the mood? Do you think are mostly like regular people are against these kind of ideologies or or pro? Um, I haven't heard any people talk about it outside of anti SJW YouTubers. Like, if I talk to like a family member or like a friend. They probably have no idea about this. <laughs> and I guess the only people that really know about this is probably the parents who see their kids just radically transform before their eyes. <laughs> okay, I would like to, to also talk because you're, you're black or, or um, person of color. I don't know that the euphemism. <laughs> the euphemism. Let me go, let, let, can I go on this little topic about like, the person of colors? Like basically, I think like the person of colors thing is actually really strange because in America, like uh, <laughs> prior to like, uh, you know, people of color, we used to call minorities colored people. <laughs> and I don't see any difference between people of color and colored people. <laughs> oh my God. And also these <laughs> colored people, I mean, it doesn't make sense because it's like, what's color, rainbow color? But well, <laughs> anyway, you, you told me that sometimes you hear this quote, like blacks cannot be racist. And, and I think you don't agree with that. Can you give us your two cents on this? Okay, when I first heard about this idea that blacks cannot be racist, I like I thought it was a joke. Like I thought no way people can actually believe that black people cannot be racist. I saw this idea floating about on MTV News. I saw it flow about in the website called The Root. I saw some major like black nationalists parenting like, this, this idea that they cannot be like racist against other white people because they don't have the power and prejudice 
in order to be racist. And I think this idea is ridiculous because like racism does not require prejudice and power to be racist. Like racism can happen on an individual basis. Like it's true that institutionalized racism can exist, but it does not require an institute to be racist. And I think like these people who have this idea that they cannot be racist because their skin color are actually the biggest racist. <laughs> um, I would like to ask you a personal question. Have you had any problems with your friends or relatives? Because I guess you just go like a contra culture, no? I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the opinion that you usually hear when you, when you expose your, your thoughts about this topic? Actually, nobody actually talked to me about my thoughts about this stuff. Like, um, I guess the most is like my brother, and my brother mostly agree with me. <laughs> well, that's cool. <laughs> but, I, but I have heard people, like, having people, you know, disenfranchised because they post their opinions online about it. And so I, my personal experience is different, but, like, other people have really bad experiences because they post their thoughts online. So do you think that most of the claims, for instance, of the, the Black Lives Matter movement says are true or are wrong? I mean, is it true that there's systemic, I don't know what this word really means, systemic racism in America or you can achieve whatever you want and it doesn't matter the color of your skin? I think that um, we don't have any kind of institutionalized racism in America, in my opinion. And the main reason why I say that is because since 1964, we have something that is called the Civil Rights Act and basically allows people to be treated equally based upon their race, their gender, their ethnicity. And so I don't think we actually have any sort of systemic racism in our country. That said, I do think that some of the concerns of Black Lives Matter, for example, like police brutality, is a huge issue. However, I don't think it's just targeting just black people. I think the police that do police brutality here target pretty much anybody, and it's unfortunate that it actually happens. And with the age of technology like cell phones, they could actually capture the stuff compared to, I guess, in the past. So I don't think we have systemic racism because we have laws against racism. However, at the same time, I think that brutality is actually an issue in our country. So what, what could you say regarding the Black Lives Matter movement? In what other claims do you actually agree? And, uh, and what other claims do you think they are biased? Um, I think that uh, some claims that I think that are not actually stuff that I agree with are stuff like uh, the fact that they claim that there's institutionalized racism. And I personally don't agree with that idea. Another thing that I don't really agree about with uh, Black Lives Matter is some of the stuff that they post on the internet. Like for example, I remember reading from the founder of Black Lives Matter that she was inspired by a really radical person in order to find her movement. Like the person that she was inspired by, I believe it was Asada Shakur. And, and that person is really uh, infamous in this country during the 70s because basically what happened was that she got really upset and I believe she shot a cop and then she went to a jail and then she escaped from jail and fled to Cuba. And so basically the founder of Black Lives Matter claimed that she got inspiration from that person. I'm like, are you crazy? Like, why would you get like inspiration from a cop killer? And like another thing that they have that I don't really agree about it's the idea that black people are always the victim. I don't think that black people are always the victim. It's true that some black people have like low income, but ultimately I think that uh, black people have the ability to succeed in America like any other group. Um, according to the data I heard more recently that the top, like, uh, what was it? The top, uh, oh my God, my words are not doing it right now. <laughs> I, <laughs> okay, the top, the per like I heard the group that had the most money in this country is the Asians. And I think it's possible for like any minority to be successful. So as long as people have a good work ethic and like good education, I believe anybody could succeed in this country. Well, I, I guess that's right. And it makes sense. If you see yourself as a victim, 
you won't ever uh, see yourself as a person like empowered, no? And also the Asians, uh, they, they tend to be pre really hard workers. Maybe that's why they are on the top of the That's <laughs> true. Like, uh, like I, there's a lot of like uh, laundry mats here, a lot of <laughs> Chinese food and stuff. So I can see why they can make a lot of money. Yeah, well, I, I, could, I can say that here in Spain, it happens something similar. We changed a little bit of topic, but we are not changing. Uh, we've been talking about the, the Black Lives Matter movement. I would like to hear your thoughts about this counter movement that it has appeared that is the alt-right. Um, one, we could say that it's like the hardcore left and the alt-right, it could be like the hardcore right. But uh, I've been trying to understand what the alt-right movement is and I, I, I don't get it because I see some stuff that it say, okay, it makes sense, freedom of speech, but then some crazy people will talk about like white supremacy and stuff and, and I don't really like it. I would like to hear your two cents because you are from there. I'm sure you have more info than I do. Okay, so based upon what I know, the, the term alt-right was coined by somebody by the name of Richard Spencer. And basically Richard Spencer, he's a well-known, infamous, like uh, white nationalist in our country. I believe he was banned in many European countries when he went to the European countries. And you probably saw him in, like, in a video when he got punched by Antifa. <laughs> and so he's kind of infamous in this country because a lot of people don't like him. But what happened was that he, uh, <laughs> he basically uh, coined the term alt-right. And he meant like white nationalism. And so he always meant for the alt-right to be about white nationalism. He always wanted the alt-right to be like about like uh, having some sort of state for white people only <laughs> and no minorities in the white only uh, countries. And so he basically wants some sort of ethno state. And I guess the alt-right, based upon his definition and the fact that he coined the term, wants the exact same thing that he wants. So, uh, but do you think that, for instance, the civil society of America is nowadays like divided on these two uh, political terms because I guess that the rising and the succeeding of Trump has to uh, have pissed off a lot of people. No, how, how, what's the mood uh, um, in terms of, of uh, political spectrum in the, in the common people that you can see? Um, it kind of depends on the state that you live in. Like for example, my state of Maryland is mostly a blue state and because it's mostly a blue state, basically a lot of people have a lot of bias against Trump. I personally myself don't like Trump that much. Mm -hmm. And the main reason why I don't really like Trump that much is because of his ideas, for example, on marijuana. I believe that Jeff Sessions, the guy who's also in power with Trump, mm -hmm. he wants to make like a marijuana illegal to use in this country. Like basically like the whole entire situation with marijuana in this country even though it's like illegal on a federal level, mm -hmm. it's legal on some states. Like it's legal in uh, DC, it's legal in Alaska, Colorado, Washington state. So some states have it legalized. However, on a federal level is not legalized, but basically like Jeff Sessions, he wants to crack down on people who use marijuana in those legalized states. He, there's also the policy, the idea of video games causing violence like tr more recently trump said that video games cause violence i'm like are you serious like there's no evidence to prove that video games cause violence so i guess the big question would be you don't like trump so is that uh does it implies that you prefer hillary <laughs> um, i mean i know uh, no, 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 i'm no, being no, no, demagogue no. with you but i mean it makes sense you know because you have to pick up the lesser evil so to speak um, I don't really like uh, Hillary that much. a matter of fact, I think she should be in jail <laughs> for a lot of the stuff she did. Like the whole entire idea of her, like, you know, I heard that she tried to, <laughs> tried to you know, destroy documents of the United States, like the emails, and she basically got away with that. She also got away with a lot of lies throughout the whole entire campaign. So I think... I don't really, I don't really like Hillary that much. I don't like Trump that much. And okay, there are some states that actually like Hillary. Like I guess New York likes Hillary. Like my state like Hillary. 
And there's like some states like uh, Texas I like her too. No, 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 not Texas. I'm uh, sorry. It was Trump that likes Texas. Like the t- the state of Texas like Trump, and there's other where state that like Trump too. So it depends on the country, like the part of the country you're part of. Like uh, like it depends on what state you visit. Sorry. So I guess the question would be, uh, how do you f- define yourself politically? I mean, it's that liberal, republican, libertarian. Classical liberal, or you just don't give a fuck, or what? <laughs> <laughs> um, personally, uh, I honestly uh, don't really care about those labels. Uh, I guess the closest to me is like you know, liberal maybe, like uh, because I tend to be left leaning on issues in regards to like gay marriage and drugs and my social attitudes and outlook on things. So, um, for instance, uh, one of the channels of the YouTube channels that I enjoy most is the, the Rubin Report. For instance, a guy is like a liberal, but not a leftist. And he interviews people from the different parts of the political spectrum, conservatives, libertarians, etc. Do you think that especially in the United States, it, um, there are some bridges that could be built? Because um, if the society is divided... Um, do you think that the people is not talking to each other this day? What do you think that it has to be done in order to, to like work together in order to make the, the country a better place to live? I think we need more Dave Rubens in the world, essentially, like basically have people to uh, have conversation with other people and, you know, actually be respectful towards each other, not shouting all the time, not typing on social media to have interactions, just basically have a face-to-face conversation and to allow people to express their opinions, disagree with those opinions, and not, you know, shout over each other for those opinions. Do you think that nowadays is it easy to talk to, uh, and express your opinion in the States or is it actually a dangerous thing to do? Um, I guess, like, in general, I don't think it's dangerous, at least in my state. However, I heard some people in other states, if they put on the Trump hats, they'll get beat up for putting on the Trump hats. So it's kind of like on the states where like people support Hillary more than Trump. So I guess the big question would be how to solve this problem, because I think it's pretty problematic that uh, a country with your First Amendment and with their, the freedom of speech right I mean, it's quite contradictory. How how to solve this? How how it would be the policy that you would you would apply in order to to I don't know relax and create an engagement dialogue? Uh, a policy. Uh, <laughs> I don't I, I I don't think I would like you know I don't want to impose a policy, but uh, I would want to, you know promote like you know ideas of conversations by doing what I do. Well, I, I will reframe the question. I'm not talking yeah. about a policy. What what part of the American mindset of the young millennial had to change, in your opinion, in order to, to create a new mood and a new environment? Um, I would say to allow them to be exposed to different ideas, allow them to have conversations with people that they don't like. Don't allow them to have safe spaces or trigger warnings and other kind of nonsense and just, you know, allow their minds to be challenged because a lot of these people, I think, don't have their minds challenged and that's why they don't really respond well to different opinions. So uh, I would like to come back uh, again to this topic briefly. So you've defined yourself as a liberal, a left person, but as Dave Rubin said, he's no longer a liberal, so to speak, or... He, he doesn't like the regressive, the regressive left, sorry. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, I don't, I don't really like any extremists in general. I don't like extremists from the right or the left or any side, so I agree. Um, changing off topic a little bit, um, you were talking about communication and exposing ideas and, and confronting and debating. And we are doing this thing right now. I mean, I barely, we barely know each other's. Um, I just talked to you yesterday via <laughs> Twitter and um, do you, uh, would you mind to make an interview tomorrow? Okay, let's do it. Um, what's the power of, of internet and YouTube and, and communicating with different people with different parts of the world? What's your opinion about this, 
new tendency that it, it seems to be appearing? I think it's a wonderful thing because what happening on YouTube and other kind of platforms is that people get to expose themselves to different ideas and to have conversations that otherwise would not happen on TV. Like there are certain subjects on TV that might be too taboo to talk about. So thanks to YouTube and platforms like that, we can have conversations without having to rely on TV. Because a lot of people, they tend to not, you know, trust the media because they're known to manipulate things. However, with YouTube, people can have these hangouts and conversations without having to, like, you know, edit the videos that much or things like that. And I think it's a wonderful thing to have people to have chats with on the Internet. I remember, uh, I think it was uh, Jordan Peterson in the Joe Rogan podcast, another great podcast, by the way. He was saying that the TV or the regular media is dying and, and I de they don't want to realize and the real marketplace of ideas actually is on, is on YouTube. I mean, I guess you, you would agree with that, with that statement, no? Yeah, I believe that good ideas can ultimately, you know, fight against bad ideas. And I believe that um, by having dialogue, we can cancel out the bad ideas and welcome in the good ideas. Okay, Tyler, we are more or less close to the end, but uh, I, I, I would really like to talk about another topic. I've been checking a little bit your, your YouTube videos and you seem to be in love with the Spanish culture and the Spanish language, <laughs> which I think it's awesome because I'm from here and I'm, I'm, and I'm glad you're interested. So it's like, this is a personal question. Why, why do you like this cultural language and since when? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, that's a really fun question to answer. Um, um, when, back when I was uh, 14 years old, uh, my first exposure, I think, to Spanish was uh, the video game Resident Evil 4. You know, like that game where like you play as uh, Leon S. Kennedy and you go to the Spain village <laughs> and shoot up the, the zombies there? Like basically, like the first cuss scene, like I had no idea what he was talking about. And so I'm like, wait, I want to know more what the guy says, like the zombies, what they say. And so I took, I think, uh, what was it, like uh, two years in Spanish in high school. And then I think uh, when I was working at my job, I um, also had some Hispanics working with me and they also spoke in Spanish. And so like every day I tried to make an attempt to learn new words in Spanish. Sometimes on my, uh, you, on my uh, Twitter page, I try to talk to people from Spain and Latin America by typing in the Spanish and they will try to correct my grammar or something. And I think my interest comes from the fact that I think, you know, it's pretty cool language. <laughs> okay, so we can have a deal here. The next interview will be in Spanish and... You <laughs> Okay, <laughs> do you want uh, to do it? Uh, sure, sure, why not, why not? It could be good practice. Okay, you will feel the pressure that I'm feeling right now because talking in, in another language, I mean, it's hard <laughs> stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, it's really hard. I can understand the pain. Yeah, the next question, or maybe just a, a reflection that I have. Um, do you think that it's important to, to broke, uh, break sorry, this, this language barrier because um, for instance, I, I, I know and I understand English for, for quite long. And it's awesome because you can have access to new information. Um, do you think what's the benefits maybe that people like you that maybe can understand a new language and also you will have access to new, to new information? Do you think that would be, would, would, uh, would be interesting that we understand each other's languages in order to, to understand each other's cultures and, and, and problems? I think in general that, um, at least at a bare minimum, that uh, schools should probably, you know, promote bilingualism because, like you said, I think it allows people to have more opportunities to talk to each other and have access to new information. And I think that um, also in our country, at least, we have a long history with, like, uh, Spain and Mexico, for example. Like, there are some states that once were part of Spain and Mexico before becoming part of the United States. So for example, I know for a fact that Florida was part of Spain before it was part of the United States. 
There was also some states like, uh, for example, uh, Texas, uh, California, Arizona, uh, New Mexico. They were part of Mexico before, before becoming part of the United States. And I also think that, yeah, there was also uh, Puerto Rico too. Like it used to be part of Spain too, before becoming part of the United States. And so I think also that uh, the reason why I guess so many of us trying to learn Spanish in this country, I guess it's because of those cultural ties too. I think that um, that information and learning a new language is important because it allows you to have access to information, allows you to have communication and to also, uh, you know, enjoy a new culture. Absolutely. I mean, I remember myself many years ago watching the first Ron Paul videos and I was like shocked, you know, and you just have to find the videos that already had subtitles and, and there weren't a lot of it. And when you just understand it, I mean, it's like whew, literally mind blowing. Yeah. Okay, Tyler, more or less the last question, or maybe I will make a, a couple more. Um, what's your plans for this uh, 2018 or maybe the next year in on, on YouTube or in your communication field? Uh, are you planning to make more, I don't know, interviews to talk about different topics or you just improvise? Just improvise. Just whatever's on my mind. Just do whatever I want. Just uh, post what I think is right at the moment and just upload it. <laughs> um, and um, I guess it would be the, the last question. I always do the same question to all the people that I interview because I think that sometimes with the political spectrum, there's too much confrontation, you know what I mean? And we, we don't talk uh, relaxedly about different topics. And it doesn't mind if you're liberal, conservative or libertarian, we just have to understand each other. So I guess it would be, what would you say to the people who are against your, or that criticize the, the things that you say in your YouTube channel? What, what could you say like briefly, like literally, uh, like honestly, that could make them change their minds or, or at least understand yours, no? But that's, that's the tricky thing about debating. I think if people disagree with me, um, they can have a chance to talk to me on my, on my YouTube page, on my social media accounts, and we can have a conversation through private messages to sort of the disagreements of what we have and agreements that we have. I am also uh, would also engage in like hangouts and talk to them on my YouTube channel on a public forum to, you know, uh, talk about it and, you know, engage in conversation that way. And so my, um, my thoughts about that is basically just talk to me just on, um, on social media all the time on, on YouTube all the time. And so just talk to me and I'll just have a conversation with you. Okay. But I will, I will try to re remake my question. I mean, okay. the thing is that I, I completely understood your, your point and actually I do the same. I'm 24 seven here. Like what, what would you say? Like, uh, have you seen this clockwork orange film? where the main character oh, yes. has his <laughs> eyes open. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what would you say to a social justice warrior or a Black Lives Matter or a guy who is from the Antifa, Antifa movement or a guy from the old right? I mean, I, I don't care. Uh, in order to, to help him to understand your point, what would be like the key core topics that do you think that they don't understand or they don't um, put effort in order to, to, I don't know, get him or, or just start a... Uh, respecting you at least i think some topics that um they might uh agree with me on would be like uh you know like issues on gay marriage uh issues on like you know women's race and and i guess if we could find like some sort of you know mutual agreements with those certain topics then i think it might be easier for people like them to uh, talk to people like me and we can find common commonality and still, you know, get along with each other. So, and actually uh, uh, that's, that's the last question <laughs> I, I promise. Do you feel optimistic about your state or, or about the United States? If you have to think about the, the way <laughs> millennials uh, are older or this Z generation will enter into the workplace or do you feel pessimistic more or less? What's, what's your mood about this? 
if they continue to not want free speech and continue to just censor people, then my view is very pessimistic. <laughs> And I cannot imagine such people in power, but unfortunately, we have such people empowered who don't want to value freedom as much. And it's unfortunate. I guess we just have to continue like saying our message online, no? Because um, if that's the reality, I mean, the only thing is to enter into the marketplace of idea and say your thing. Right. Okay, Tyler. I mean, it was a pleasure, at least for me, I guess for 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 the people who are watching this interview too uh, and I'm, I'm glad that you gave us a uh, part of your time and we had an engaging conversation so hope to see you soon um i don't know if it's going to be in this in, in spain or in the states but at least you are appear, <laughs> <laughs> at least you appear on my screen and that's enough for me i definitely want to see like catalonia and also like madrid someday okay okay <laughs> we will definitely show you uh, thank you, thank you guys from Spanish Libertarian. Um, if you don't know English, maybe it's going to be hard for you to, to understand this video. We will try to add subtitles, but it takes a lot of effort. If not, just learn English. I mean, <laughs> I mean that, that's, the, that's the honest advice I could give you because as, I, as we said, you open a, a new wall and you can have conversations with uh, Awesome people like Tyler. Tyler, see you next time and take care, man. Hasta luego. Hasta luego.